This is another episode of Design Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. And now the architects, Doug Pat and Stephen Chung. You are watching or listening to the Design Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. I am Steve. That's Doug. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, Steve. How you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. Today we're going to talk about tools that an architect uses. And as I thought about this, I thought about it long and hard, and I realized that uh, I'm using very different tools than I used to use. How about yourself? Yes and no. I mean, uh, you know, the computer took over our lives, so we definitely changed the pair or that changed the paradigm. Uh, but I still use some old tools too, so I'm going to talk about those today. You know what's so frustrating is that uh, I think you and I we're the same era. We both uh, worked very hard to become very good draftsmen and, huh. and dra- drawing freehand, and I can build models really well. And all of that is very painful and takes a lot of time. Yeah. And by the time we were sort of finished with school and finished with graduate school and entering into the workforce in the '90s, mid '90s, whatever. Um, now that skill was becoming sort of less, <laughs> less oh valued. Gosh. And uh, <laughs> now I don't even know, if I look at a student portfolio, I don't really see any hand drawing anymore. I don't see anything. Um, I still think that an architect needs to have a very good eye and how they're, they compose things, how they draw things with a computer. But in terms of seeing things drawn by hand, I don't see it. Yeah, no, you really don't see a whole lot of that today. It's unfortunate. Oh, well, it is what it is. <laughs> All right. I'm going to let you go first. Uh, three tools, three of our favorite tools. Uh, Doug, you are up. So, uh, you know, it's interesting you mention uh, you don't see people uh, doing a whole lot of drawing or at least uh, representations of what they're working on in that respect. Um, I mentioned an article that was in the Wall Street Journal. It had to have been back in like 2010, and it was about uh, kids learning how to write uh, and, and write in cursive and how good that was uh, for their brain. So they actually did a study about that. So we know that using your hands is actually really important for brain function. So even if you're not going to be using all of these tools, learning how to do these things is going to be good for you long term. So I'm going to talk about three drafting tools today that are really my absolute favorite. So the first thing I'm going to talk about today is uh, if you're watching us on video, the Ames Lettering Guide, and I'll have some images up. Um, This is about four inches by two inches. It's plexi, uh, acrylic. Uh, it's about a sixteenth of an inch thick, and this is a tool that people used to use um, when they were drafting. And it is a very simple tool. It looks really complicated, but all it really does is helps you to create horizontal lines on a piece of paper or a piece of mylar, depending on what he, what you're using to write, so that you can hand letter. So this is pretty neat. So I would encourage you to take a look at. Uh, we'll put a link. Uh, perhaps in the description box here. I made a video for Alvin and Company who sells drafting tools. And this is a great video about how just how to use the uh, Ames lettering guide. And it's like two or three minutes long, tells you all about this thing. So uh, in um, in brief, you can create all kinds of horizontal lines at different widths using the guide. So in the far left, there's eighth inch increments in the center. There's this uh, spinny dial, and this allows you to create um, Um, spacing in both metric and English units. Uh, And uh, you can also turn this thing and use it as your drafting triangle. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in my next tip. But uh, this thing comes with instructions and it's super fun to use. And and the way it's used is you need a parallel rule or a T-square. And again, these are tools that you'll be able to find at your local art supply store. Hopefully you set this down or set it to the underside of either the parallel rule or the T-square, and it simply slides across your desk. So you're going to need some sort of surface to draft on. Maybe it's a um, an independent table or a big drafting table like architects used to have in their offices. But this is a really neat tool, and I've been using it for decades. I still make videos with it, and I, and I love to uh, create architectural hand lettering. And then the neat thing about that is uh, whenever I letter something for my kids or it's a birthday, people love uh, architects hand lettering. So anyway, the Ames lettering guide is my first absolute favorite tool. How about you, Stephen? And, and you've got a, a great video on YouTube I've seen about the uh, architects uh, lettering. It's a, I think it's like 2 million views of the last I saw. So that's a, that's a skill that you and I both learned a long time ago. And I have to say <laughs> that just like you, <clears throat> when I sort of pull it out and I note up a drawing, it takes a little bit longer to do it. But then 
if I know that people are going to read it, I think they're like, oh, wow, that's so cool. Just yes. I don't know why they, they, people like it so much, but they love it. there is a certain style of hand lettering that architects that were trained to do a long time ago. Now, young people don't know how to do it. So it's kind of neat to be able to have one skill that a few people sort of like or enjoy. Yep. How to write like an architect. All right. So that's a great. That's great. I like that tip. Now, of course, you you are going old school and I'm going, I guess, I don't know if it's new school or not, but these, some of, you know, I like to play with some of these toys. My first <clears throat> is a drone. And, you know, we're gadget guys. I, I would say most architects are gadget guys. So just the idea of flying something up like a remote controlled something up in the air is kind of cool. Um, but what's happened is that um, it's become so easy to fly this thing. It's a DJI Phantom drone. It's, they've now uh, passed it with a newer model, but it's uh, not It's expensive, but um, it's very easy to fly. It's incredibly stable. And what's amazing about it is this is the gimbal. This is the camera that is the camera on the drone, which it doesn't matter how windy it is up there up to 25 miles an hour. I mean, basically, this gimbal is moving independently. Um, uh, of the drone and it's really correcting and, and sort of uh, leveling any kind of view. So you can have video that looks incredibly stationary um, in a drone that's sort of rocking in the wind. And so how do I use this? I mean, I'm using it now when I evaluate a site. That's the first thing I do if I have a new house client. We, I'll bring the drone to their house. I'll evaluate their immediate site. That is, I'll look at the house in the immediate um, surroundings. So I'll kind of, kind of look around the house itself, kind of inspect the roof, look at the trees, get up to a certain height to see if we have a two-story house or even a two-story and a half house. What would they see from certain vantage points? Would they have views? I might even get up even a little higher just to kind of get a sense of the distant <clears throat> surroundings, get a sense of where the sun's coming from, what sort of distant views there might be. Um, I'm really using it as a tool to evaluate uh, the potential of a project. So it's been really helpful in this Florida project. I mean, I, I can't lie. The client, of course, is always excited just to sort of see these ha, cool nice. images of their house from the sky. It's uh, does Google Earth one better and Bing one better. But, but um, it's just a it's a great tool in terms of evaluating the potential of a property. So um, it's a fun toy, but I am using it in my work and, uh, and you know for uh, for freestanding houses. Um, and uh, so no, I, I think it's a great tool, great uh, great fun, and something that just uh, just I've started using the past couple of years and I'm using it all the time now. I'll, I'll find excuses. <laughs> to bring it to to, uh, to evaluate a property. That's very cool, man. How long ago did you buy that? Gosh, this was you know this is related to cool space of the TV show I was working on, and and at that time drones were not quite far along. It was 2014, 2015, and they really made incredible advances in a very short amount of time. And I have to say. Um, it's really the camera, the gimbal. That's what the amazing technology is. But now, now that they've created that technology, they've created this handheld, handheld uh, gimbal. And really, you can put your phone in here. And then this, this camera is is can move independently. This is the the, the, the camera that it's on the drone, but now it's handheld. So if I want to walk through a house or around a house, it's doing the same thing. It's basically a steady cam. It, it, it's incredibly smooth footage. I don't use this as much. I, I kind of bought it because I thought it was a great to, uh, tool and toy and fantastic for certainly for video. In terms of evaluating a building, I mean, I do it if I'm kind of a want to have a walking sort of tour through something or walking through an existing house if we're going to renovate it and just to have some good video, uh, good video footage. Certainly one better than a camera phone. So, yeah, um, yeah great, great new tools. Uh, I love the technology and uh, uh, we'll see if I can incorporate this more into uh, future projects. Very cool, man. I, so now as I'm going to describe my second <laughs> favorite tool, <laughs> it comes doesn't even come close to that. So this is my second favorite tool. And what is that? <laughs> this is a this is a little lettering triangle. <laughs> so I love this thing. So why do I love it so much? Well, it's a 3060 triangle. And again, you can get it at any art supply store, one would hope. Um, now, what, what do I use this for? So, you know, uh, in architectural hand lettering, when I was taught how to hand letter, I was taught that you want to make all of your verticals uh, with a triangle or with a yeah. straight edge. And then all of your horizontals and your curves, you're going to do by hand. And the reason is to speed up the lettering. So the neat thing about using this triangle is that it slides across the T square or the or the parallel rule now I'm righty so I'm and so I'm going to be sliding this across 
what I'm writing. Now, the challenge here is that you're going to smear uh, what you're writing, even with, let's say, pencil on mylar. That's going to smear as your hands, mm -hmm. uh, they get wet and, uh, you know, you're hot and you're working on these drawings and uh, working away on a drafting table. So one of the things I learned to do early on was take a couple pieces of drafting tape and you cut them and you make them a certain thickness. So maybe they're two or three uh, pieces thick and then you stick them on here. And then when you set this uh, underneath the parallel rule and slide it across the page, it doesn't smear anything, particularly ink. So uh, unless you're moving really, really fast, sometimes the ink uh, will bubble up too high. And it does, smear. but these pieces of tape help an awful lot for smearing. So it's a great size to use if you want to do any hand lettering, and uh, it's about two inches by four inches. And I like the clear uh, because you can see straight through it. Although some people like to buy orange or. Uh, yellow in color. I still use this triangle all the time. So um, use a small lettering triangle when you hand letter. And there you have my second most favorite architecture tool. You know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, I was not distracted. I was listening, but I was trying to find my own triangle. Which has, <laughs> as you as you said, it has the, uh, I have drafting dots, little pieces of tape, just like you on, under the corners so that, as you say, when you slide that it doesn't, it doesn't smudge a drawing, but yeah. I have one step beyond, I use an adjustable triangle because I like having that little knob. Yes. Right. To hold the triangle, move it around. It's even easier to sort of manipulate. I don't well, use the actual adjustable part draft. of it. I just like the knob. Yeah. The knob's great. It makes it so much easier to pick up and move. So. <laughs> All right. Number so two. I, I, Number like two. Your, I love your, uh, your old tools. Thanks, man. <laughs> All right, Doug, my, my second tip, again, is going a slightly high tech. It's not super high tech for an architect, but it's high tech in the sense of how, uh, well, compared to your triangle. So um, <laughs> I, 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 talk, I talked, about, uh, talked about drones and one place where I've been using it and incorporating into the work has to do with the integration of um, those, that footage, that aerial footage with SketchUp and Google Earth. So. These, these programs to me are amazing. So SketchUp is a three-dimensional, it's a software. It's pretty easy to use. It was created uh, created by Google. Well, it yep. used to be Google, it was sold. Um, but um, it's you're able to make anything three-dimensional. It's pretty easy to use. It's widely used among everyone, not just architects. There is a pro version for architects that uh, offers a little bit more um, more tools that I, that I use, but it, it's pretty much anyone can use it. And so what I love about SketchUp is that it's, again, being part of Google at that time, Google Earth and SketchUp sort of talk to each other, meaning I can make a model of a house and then through Google Earth, I can put that model into the world, drop it in, and then evaluate it with real world conditions. So I can then check the sun in January at three o'clock in the afternoon and in the real world know what it's doing to your house, your proposed project. And so I think it's it, it's it's an amazing tool. Google Earth certainly to for me whenever I see a new project, especially if it's far away, not even even if it's close, I'll fly around that neighborhood, do concentric circles outward just to kind of understand what's there. I will um, then go to Bing Maps because Bing Maps has a, a slightly different technology or a different uh, a different uh, I guess offering where you can see bird's eye views from four perspectives, so you can see that lot from four different angles, which is a little bit better quality than Google Earth. Google Earth being mostly kind of a plan. I think that they have some 3D, but it's not so high end or so so well, the resolution is not so great. Um, but again, I think that what's amazing is when SketchUp is paired with Google Earth, now you can really evaluate what the two can do together. You can basically take that SketchUp model and put it into Google Earth. So I really feel very confident when I evaluate something, um, what it's doing, and then Yes, with the drone, with the drone photography. Now I do have much more precise, um, much more accurate in terms of what the you know where those trees, what the views are. I can really kind of specifically zoom in on a certain area. So I think all these tools that have to do with um, well, those great cameras, but seeing things from the sky. I mean, I think architects often like to see and understand the big picture, whether it's a site plan or a three-dimensional model, but it's or a physical model. We like seeing the whole thing. And um, so having the tools that will now allow us to get up and look down on something the way that we used to with site plans and, and uh, site models, um, I think is awesome. So these are, these are new tools 
not that new, but their tools are integrated into the way I work. It's they're all really easy to use, which is really important for me because I, while I'm talking about technology, I'm not Mr. Tech either. I just think I need when tools are easy to use, then I'll certainly incorporate them into what I'm doing. So sketch up with Google Earth. And by the way, um, these are things that I do show um, uh, owners, clients. Um, I'm able to, you know, hey, download SketchUp and let me show you what what your house looks like in the world in Google Earth, and, and they're able to do that, which is kind of neat. So, do you use SketchUp to draft as well? I do. Uh, drafting two dimensionally, I'll still use AutoCAD. I know okay. I'm not I'm not a Revit, which is the more advanced that what people are using, but I like AutoCAD with SketchUp. That seems to be as much as technology I can sort of take. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to explain that the uh, CAD is really good for two dimensions, whereas yeah. SketchUp, in terms of drafting, it's it's not quite there for drafting. I okay. think it's really more of a three-dimensional tool. Yeah. Um, and so I think those paired together work very well. And again, with Google Earth, I mean, these are all um, things which are readily available. Google Earth is free. SketchUp is free. Um, um, and uh, yeah, so I think it's it's a great great for architects, great for people who are not architects. Yeah, great suggestion. Um, Okay, so my third tip, uh, my third favorite object is this. So this is a pencil. <laughs> it's actually a mechanical pencil. Now, I started using mechanical pencils in graduate school. Before that, I used uh, the, you know, the technical architectural lead holders, right. uh, the traditional lead holders. So the leads are, you know, like a sixteenth of an inch thick. They're super long. You slide them in, and then you use this big mechanism to sharpen your pencil, or you could use your electric eraser. So anyway, this is really neat. This is great for hand lettering. So when I was at Alvin, this is like an advertisement for Alvin. They they gave me. Uh, some more mechanical pencils. So they, they you make a 0 0.9, a 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.3. What that point is, is 0.3 millimeters, 0.5 millimeters, 0.7 millimeters. That's the, the thickness of the lead. Now, of course, we don't use lead anymore. And I'm going to show some images too, if you guys aren't watching video, but we've got these uh, little containers. Uh, you'll see them at the art store and wonder what they are. They hold these small, uh, these little tubes of graphite and those pieces of graphite then slide uh, right into your mechanical pencil. So the pencil, the top comes off and the eraser comes off and the leads go into the top there. Uh, and then this is, it's super simple. You kind of shake it and you click it and eventually the lead comes out in the end. Now, the reason I, I love using these uh, pencils is uh, it's always sharp. Um, so when you're using the small holes on the names lettering guide, for example, those leads fit very nicely uh, into these openings if you're using 0.3 or 0.5. And the other neat thing, and I'll show some images here, I made, I made a couple videos about writing and drawing and hand lettering like an architect you check out on YouTube. Um, but what I explain in some of those is you can take this pencil and a piece of paper and you simply spin the pencil in your hand on that piece of paper and it sharpens the lead for you. Uh, so rather than having to use a sharpener, the lead is so fine that you can get it sharp real quickly and then do some very nice fine lines and then move your triangle and your parallel rule and sharpen it again. Uh, and the neat thing about hand lettering is, you know, um, calligraphy uh, typically features thin lines and thick lines. And the neat thing about this pencil is if you uh, hold it in one direction and just rub it on a piece of paper, run it on a piece of paper, you're gonna get a very flat surface you can then use for the thick lines in your hand lettering. And you'll see that uh, I did a video called How to Letter with Lead. And in that video, it kind of features the thick lines and those thin lines, which is really neat. So I use this pencil for, you know, for all of my drafting. And I've had I've had these two mechanical pencils for probably 20 years. Um, so anyway, they're uh, they're great tools. And if you're going to uh, do any sort of drafting, I would I would skip the uh, lead holder and I'd get a mechanical pencil or a series of them. And I think I, ju I just did. Um, all right. I think I, I know I just did a review of a mechanical pencil that's all stainless steel or titanium or brass and uh, you can find um, uh, that review on my website as well but the neat thing about that is you can change out the interior uh, of the pencil rather than buying five of them and that'll feature different leads for you so anyway a mechanical pencil is my third most favorite object architectural object in the world there you, you still have. use it 
I do. I, I use it all the time. I mean, I've got a couple on my desk and I write with it all the time. So, yeah. Do you um, do you maintain a sketchbook or sketchbooks or series as you go along? Not at, not anymore. I used <clears throat> to keep sketchbooks. I just don't even have time. How about you? Do you do you, do you, you do know that? what? I, I try. I buy the I buy the same kind of book. Um, and then when I'm thinking about it, when I'm conscious about it, I, I try to draw on it nicely and I yeah I try to I try to do that but I always I always lose this because I'm just I'm just start scribbling you know this is not beautiful this is just me scribbling notes I'm not even thinking right. about what I'm doing and I'm just thinking through a problem so this is not meant for public consumption yeah but I, I see a lot of architects that that really think about it yeah and they I saw you know my friend Eric Reinhold he's got this little sketchbook format that he uses he hand letters like the the you know the date and when he draws, it's like almost like meant for someone to come see it. And it's like so beautiful when you see this library of books like that. And I think, yeah. I'm going to do that. I can do that. And after the second day, I'm like, uh, I'm like you that. know, pick up son at school, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, how about the, look at that? Look at those horrible drawings. That's like, should the lamp look like this? And I'm not even trying. I'm just kind of thinking. Yeah. And uh, it's hard to have that discipline, I guess. That's what it's for. And I use the same <laughs> thing. I've got books that I keep for work. And I sketch in those, and they're lined pads, and they're useless. But that's, what, <laughs> exactly. that's what I draw in. Yeah, so someone comes, and they look at the archive. They're like, oh, you can have my entire archive. It's like, oh, this is it? Just yeah. like, you know, buy groceries. Oh, here's a fence. You know, oh, call this guy. It's boring stuff. So, oh, yeah. well. All right. My uh, my third technology, and this is the, uh, I guess, the continuation of the low-tech versus high-tech, which is not the way I am. It's just that these are tools I've noticed that I've been using and I have not used to use, that I did not use in the past. Uh, and it's screen sharing software. Um, and because I do now more work in other places, um, I, people were initially were like, oh, I need to come see you in person. And I said, well, why don't we do the screen share? Yeah. <clears throat> and so what it's what it's doing is I have so much on my you know computer, obviously, with the 3D model, with the Google Earth I talked about, with my drone video, with uh, plans, and I've got multiple uh, monitors. And basically, I give them a link. I say, click this link at 12 o'clock, and let's get on the line. And they basically can just see my screen. They can actually see my face if they want, but that's not really the point. The point is to see my screen. And now I can really, in a very clear way, take them through the entire project in a way that if they were in my office, I would have them pinned up on the wall, I guess. I would sort of pin things on a wall. Um, now I don't really bother with that. I say, well, look, look here's option one. Here's a computer model. Here's all the views I've set for them. I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. Wait, what What if we did this? I can do it in front of them. Um, do you remember that earlier thing we saw? Look, let me pull up the precedent folder, open that thing up, and there they are. And it's really just, uh, um, it's, it's a great communication tool. I find letting people into my screen, which I don't know if people like to do that, but for me, uh, I've got it all sort of organized so that um, you know, I put on my desktop a folder that basically has everything to do with that project so that we're on the call. It's all like right there. It's not like I have to go back to my desk and pull out the drawing from, you know, August. I just say, oh, sh let's go back, open it up. There you go. And then on the screen, I can sort of, you know, with a pointer kind of talk about here or that, or let me show you something else. Oh, you know what? Let me go to Google real quick and pull up. This is what I was thinking about for that. And I pull it up. It just we get so much done in such a short amount of time. And What's also cool is I've got some clients that are very active and I say, hey, you want to take my cursor? I give them control, then they can sort of point, what if we did something over here like this? I could give me, let me have control back. Do you mean like this? Yes, yeah, something like that. Okay, let me work on that. I'll get back to you next time. So it's it's amazing because now I have clients, um, a client in, uh, in Boston who's probably 20 minutes away from me. He's a busy guy. Why meet in person when he just can jump on my screen and hey, what do you think about this? And we go on, we do a screen share, and um, it's incredibly productive. So I, I find that to be fantastic, first as a tool uh, for working with people for far away, but now just as an ease, it's it just a convenience. I mean, again, I have client, a client who's very close, no need to go see him in person, which in Boston, to drive there half an hour, park this, that. It's like <clears throat> two hours wasted. Maybe it's better just to do the screen share. So um, I think for the younger people or people who are kind of more keen to new technology this has been amazing i think still for the older older thinking people they still like to meet so um, um but it but it's trending as more people are able to use this again all i have to do is click the button and here now you can see my screen so if they're able to do that uh, it works so this has been a really amazing tool for me trying to do work in other places that's really cool i, I love it i've done the same thing but i i don't use it 
uh, as readily as you do. I, I'll think about it now. That's awesome. It is because you travel. I know you travel for your work. It's, it's yeah. Great. It's a great tool. Um, I find it amazing, and I, I like the the flexibility of saying, "Oh, let me go and Google real quick and type in this and go to that manufacturer." Do you mean this? Yeah, something like that. It's just such a great um, working tool, collaborative tool. I find. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so uh, that's three tools. Three tools from Doug. Three tools from me. Uh, I guess one a little more low tech, a little more high tech, but uh, nevertheless, these are all tools that that we're both using and a lot of the tools you talked about, I, I mean, I use as well. I just try to find, I knew your, those are your favorite things. I'm going to try to find <laughs> that, that uh, maybe new things that I've been using. Okay. So um, we do have a question of the week and this is interesting, Doug, because I don't know a lot about it, although I've been researching it. So um, I'm trying to understand it. Um, dear Doug and Steve, this is from John from Massachusetts. I am considering adding solar panels to my house. I had met with the salesperson and I feel about unsure about it all. After all, he's a salesperson. Can I hire an architect to advise me on this decision? Or would that be some kind of engineer? It's a huge investment in cost, and I feel a bit confused as to what to do. Wow, what a great question. Well, from what I do know, number one, um, if you're going to consult an architect, that's really going to be an aesthetic issue. If you're going to consult somebody about how they work, how well they work, how much they cost, you're going to consult a solar panel company. So if you've got a nice house, you've got a neighborhood with an association, or you're concerned in any way that these things are going to be unsightly, I would definitely consult a designer of some sort, likely an architect, take a look at the house, decide where they best would go. Now, of course, it has a lot to do with sunlight, which the architect can help you with. Uh, outside of that, you, I would call a professional uh, who deals in these things to talk to them about how much they cost and what they're going to do for you. My experience thus far with anything solar uh, is that it's very expensive up front and it takes a long time to pay for itself. Uh, I would also say I was at an AIA convention a number of years ago, and there was a guy there who was big into energy and green building, and he said, look, unless you're up there every year cleaning these things, they lose efficiency very, very quickly. So they get filthy up on the roof, particularly if you're closer to a city, and the efficiency goes way down. So if you're going to buy solar panels, you better plan on cleaning those solar panels. You're not going to get the kind of energy functionality out of them uh, that you are planning on. So lots to think about with solar panels uh, beyond just, you know, how are they going to look? I do also know when Barack Obama was president, uh, there were um, some incentives to buy these things, mm -hmm. tax incentives, which have gone away uh, or which have likely uh, gone away or will go away with mm -hmm. this new administration. So that could be a challenge as well. But, you know, the thing that's frustrating for me is um, it's a technology which is being pushed on the consumer because of tax benefits. But other than this carbon footprint thing, um, it's really not ready even today, from what I understand, uh, for prime time. Uh, mm. So anyway, that's my impression. I could be wrong. I'd love to hear from people who tell me I'm completely off base on this, but that's where I'm at. This um, this is interesting because I have, I have researched this a little bit for my own house. And um, and so I, I know what this person is talking about with the salesperson because the guy is a salesperson. He's trying to sell you this expensive system, right. um, 30, 40,000, whatever it is, is it? Oh, in five years, you'll make all your money back. And, and so you want to talk to somebody else and it's not necessarily an architect. It could be an architect, but it seems like the idea of having an independent, um, consultant. And I think they're out there now, um, people who, who just are, are able to assess, um, whether it makes sense for your house to have a system because it really has to do with how much sun you're getting, direct sun, solar, uh, south sun. Um, if you have a pitched roof and it's sort of pitched the wrong way, maybe it's not going to make a lot of sense. Um, of course, the salesperson is still hoping to make that sale. Um, I think your point about the cleaning is a really good one because from what I understand, solar panels are 20% efficient, which is not efficient to begin with. That means 20% of the 100, you know, it's 100% of sun hitting the solar, 20% of it's kind of used for energy. So that's that's when you start. So over time, I'm sure it's less and less and less. So um, you kind of wonder about that. Um, so I, I think having a, a consultant uh, look at something for a couple of hours, I don't know how much they cost, maybe it's a couple hundred dollars, but if you're talking about a $40,000 investment, it's, it's certainly well worth the uh, cost. It, it could be an architect, it doesn't necessarily have to be an architect. This is its own specialty. 
a lot of architects know about this, um, yeah. have learned about it. It's not it's not necessarily they've learned about it in school. Or they've sort of done some work after the fact, but some specialize in energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy and other things. Many do not. I don't. Um, I am reading about it, trying to learn about it to get up to speed. I understand a lot about it, but in terms of having someone pay me to advise them, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. Um, so I think I, for this person, I would advise definitely looking for somebody who's independent, who can who can uh, review and assess. And as what to do, I, I agree with you. There's a lot of incentives right now which are um, expiring soon uh, because this administration is sort of less interested in re renewable energy. It feels like solar is a good idea. It feels like trying to find an alternative energy sources is a great idea. I guess it's just an evaluation. It's it's a lot of cost and really does it make. Do you really make that investment back? And if you don't care about that, maybe it's just a matter of feeling like you're doing the right thing, I guess. Um, so I think there's a lot of things to factor. And certainly your comment about the aesthetics. I mean, if you've got a, a an exposed, uh, you know, I, I have a flat roof and a parapet, so I could put solar panels and they wouldn't be visible. But let's say you have a, a pitched roof, a beautiful kind of gable roof or gables roofs, and then you've got to put panels everywhere. Uh, maybe it's not so great. Maybe it's not the nicest thing to see <laughs> on your house. So. Um, a lot of things to consider, but uh, yeah, look for look for an outside consultant and uh, have them give their own independent uh, assessment. And I think that probably makes the most sense. Right on. All right, Doug, take it away. So you've been watching or listening to Design Your Dream Home, Doug and Steve. Drop us a line via email anytime. You know, we love to hear from you guys. So shoot us an email and ask us a question. And thanks for watching. We look forward to seeing you next time.